So let's take a look at the CTCR document, the End Times, a study on eschatology and millennialism from way back when, 89. All right, so you read through the 50-some pages of this, Jim, right? Yes, you did. Good for you. Good. Any thoughts, reflections, observations? What would you think? I like the diagram at the end. You like the diagram on page 45. <laughs> Everybody likes the pictures. Whenever, whenever the uh, LCMS puts out anything about the eschaton, there's always a diagram. Is there? Huh, must be part of our heritage. All right, so you like the diagram. Any other thoughts? What's that? Did Luther have diagrams? Not that I'm aware of. I don't think so. Just woodcuts, but he didn't draw them. All right, any other reactions or thoughts? Yes, Coleman. What is, what is so difficult about you will not know the time or the place? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of like, well, if you're dumb, you won't know. But, you know, if you're really smart, you'll figure it out. And, and kind of that's the assumption that people operate with. And so then away they go and they're off doing all kinds of craziness. So you're right. It gets a little bit nuts how um, people aren't content just to um, not know. They want to know. All right. Good. Okay. All right. So, let's take a look then at what's going on in here, and we'll get to the diagram eventually. Was this a good document or a not good one? Yeah, Kyle. Sorry, Go ahead. Um, how prevalent are um, kind of pre- and post-millennial uh, views before uh, the 1800s? Um, we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, good. So, good back document, bad document. What would you think? All right, pretty solid. Dr. Robbie would be happy to know that. He was the primary author, or the first author. Do you not? Yeah, you're not supposed to know that, but now you do. All right. And this is also, interestingly, came out before all of um, Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series that came out and made all the big thing. And so then there was another document that came out about that, and that was done by um, Reed Lessing to try to address some of that stuff. But it's pretty much just the same stuff. People just get, keep on getting messed up. Um, how important is it to kind of get this stuff figured out? Yeah, I think it's kind of significant, kind of important. Um, is this stuff you're going to have, you're going to encounter it actually in parish level life? Yeah, you are. Um, and one of the ironic things is that um, some of your best members will be the ones that tend to get kind of messed up on this stuff. Now, why is that? They're curious. Perhaps the Christian literature of the day. Yeah, they're the ones who are frequenting Christian bookstores and listening to Christian radio, and they're, they've got Christian friends, and the Christian friends are telling them, hey, read this book, read this book. And so then they, start, they think they're really advancing in their biblical knowledge, but they're really getting sucked down a premillennial pre, pre hellhole, and they don't realize it. And so it, this will happen. So you need to be tuned into this stuff and be prepared. I've had some rather lively discussions with people who are solid in the faith about Israel and the land of Israel, and wow. And so um, you need to be ready for this, and don't, don't be shocked, um, and don't just assume everybody's got it straight. You know, kind of hear, feel people out and see what's going on. You'll, you might be surprised at the kind of views people are, you know, espousing, and it's because they've just been inculcated in their Christian worldview. Um, and in America, it is thick with premillennialism. It just, that's what's thick. I remember talking to um, an exchange student once from somewhere in Russia or somewhere like that, or China, I can't remember what it was, somewhere in the East, and they were here in the U.S. and found out I was a Christian. They said, oh, so you, you know, they were all curious about my beliefs about Christ and coming and things. So when I said, well, I don't believe any of that stuff, they were shocked. Because, you know, their, their opinion, if you're a Christian in America, that's what you believe. They just run it all together. So that's another part of the reality is that people just make the connection that to be a Christian, you're an American, or you're a premillennial dispensationalist. Everybody is. And it's just kind of, it goes together. It's, you know, evangelicalism just runs with it. And so this is another reason why we've got to be clear on what we teach and where we're coming from, because it's not assumed or understood. Brian. After I read this, I, like, uh, like 10 minutes after I was talking to someone about, they, they were like, um, the rapture's going to happen. St. Paul believed it. And he, he quotes, you know, yeah. we caught up in the air. And I was like, well, the Greek word coming from this, like, doesn't mean that. He goes, well, haven't you read the text? That's what it says. And like I read the text in Greek, and it isn't what it says. And he was just like, "Man, read the text." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "What are you? I am." Yeah. But it was just like completely just right. You know, no, you're wrong. Well, that's where you start getting into. It gets a little thick into the stuff to be, you know. And so the other thing is, some of you who grew up in nice 
sheltered, happy LCMS circles. Never heard any of this stuff. Um, I went to college before I heard anybody use the word rapture. I had no idea what they were talking about. You know, we joked about the rapture window at the top of the chapel. I didn't know what they were talking about. I had no idea. You know, in case of rapture, break glass, you know, kind of stuff. I had no idea what they were talking about. And so, because I was sheltered from all this stuff. But you, you will encounter this, and you need to be prepared. So even if you don't know anybody who believes this stuff, you're going to find people who do. And so you need to be conversant with these things. All right, so let's get into this. So we're talking about the whole millennial kind of stuff. This is what Pieper had talked about. Remember any name? Chiliasm. So chiliasm, millennialism, same thing. The document, my one knock against this document is it's a little bit convoluted in how it's structured, but I won't blame Robbie for that. It maybe came out of, came out of plenary that way. I don't know. But it kind of starts off with this, and then it does this, and it goes back and picks up something it should have done at the beginning. And so it's kind of you know, it's got too many lists and too many categories, and it's not as clean and linear as it might be. Just my one knock against it. I, maybe you didn't experience that, but I, I think it's a little bit convoluted because it starts off by talking about the four, the three or four millennial views. How many do they have here? The, yeah, the, you know, they have the basic, yeah, four millennial views, and then they have the excursions on Seventh-day Adventism for some reason there, and then they start talking about the right views, and then they come back again later with a whole big section on what's wrong with premillennialism when they already talked about it once already, and so it gets a little bit convoluted, but anyway. Now, so having talked about this, when we're talking about the millennium, what we are talking about is this idea of the thousand-year reign, all right? And this is coming primarily from the apocalypse where we have the idea of the thousand. And I've already told you, just kind of hinting at some of these things, that when you're any, anytime you're dealing with the apocalyptic literature, you've got to pay attention to numbers and be careful with how you handle the numbers. Numbers are codes. They're conveying stuff. And numbers are rich in imagery. But don't get, don't get all worked up about the numbers. You've got to kind of figure out what, what's going on with them. So thousand just basically means really complete, nothing left out. That's kind of what's going on here. So that's what's happening with the thousand-year reign. Now, what comes out of this, though, is we have these four views of how to handle this. And so the first one we're going to talk about is a dispensational premillennial view. Dispen, dispen, oh, okay, I left out a letter or two. Okay, dispensational premillennialism. Now, the premillennialism means what? Pre-what? Pre, while the premillennialism means that before the millennium starts, what's going to happen? The rapture. Now, what do we mean by rapture? We're already jumping way ahead into our vocab here, but what do we mean by the rapture? That, that the believers are taken from this. The believers are going to be swept up, disappear from this earth, and be transferred to the eternal reality. Heaven, God's presence, and they're going to be snatched out of this earth. That's the secret rapture, and no one's going to know what's going to happen. It's not not announced, and suddenly, it's just going to be all the Christians are gone, and this is this is the stuff of movies, literally, because you know the the Christian airplane pilot suddenly gone, and the plane's crashing, you know, and you know cars, no drivers, you know, and college professor standing in front of the group, all of a sudden, his whole class is gone. He's still there. Um, He's a college professor. He's not going. Um, and so, so the, the rapture happens, and boom, you know, instantly. Now, one would think that if this happened, this would be like a worldwide phenomenon, but of course it all gets explained away, and everybody, life just goes on in spite of the rapture happening. But that's all the fun gets later here. So that's the pre-millennial. So the whole point is, before the millennium gets up and going, there's a rapture, and God's people are snatched away. So pre-millennial. Okay? And then the sense then is that the pre is also then Christ's return. Okay? So you have the rapture, things get nasty, and then Christ returns and he establishes a millennial kingdom in this world. So the real pre is often kind of zeroing in on the rapture, the pre-trib rapture. Okay? But the pre-millennialism and pre, the pre and pre-millennialism really has to do with the return of Christ. That's the biggie. Okay? So that's the big thing. We'll get back to the rapture more later. It's the return of Christ that we're pre. So the millennium comes before, I mean, I'm sorry, after the return of Christ. So Christ's return comes first and then the millennium. So premillennial means the return is before the millennium. Premillennial, Christ returns premillennial. He returns and establishes the millennial kingdom in this world. But he's got to come first. So once he comes, he establishes his thousand-year reign. 
that's pre, okay? And then we're going to talk about, I'm trying to remember if they divide out the historic premillennialism here. I think they do. Yeah, okay. So then they make a new category called just historic premillennialism. This is part of the confusion, in my opinion. And then the third category they have is postmillennialism. And then the fourth category is amillennialism, okay? All right. So the amillennialism or amillennialism, however you want to handle the alpha privative. And so we have our four options here. Um, now, one and two are basically the same. The only reason one gets split out is because it's so pervasive in America and so insidious. And that's why it gets its whole last section of this document, another 15 pages piled on, because this is the one that causes all the trouble in our context. But these are the, th the three real options that are around. Historic premillennialism goes all the way back to the time of the early church. And there were those who were kind of holding to this view. So these views have been around for a long time, okay? This kind of historic view of this. And there's also sometimes, this document doesn't talk about this, but there's also another way of interpreting the kind of stuff, the apocalyptic literature, the preterist view. Have you heard of that? You encounter that in exegetical stuff? You will hear this on occasion. A preterist view is reading the apocalypse as strictly historical. It's talking about Nero. It's talking about Rome, and that's it. And so the things talked about in the apocalypse have all been done. They were all accomplished pretty much in John's lifetime, and that's it. So this is what would be it's called a strictly preterist view, where you're limiting it to a merely historical account, and it's not talking about future stuff at all. So this is also a view you'll hear people sometimes hold about how to handle this you know, apocalyptic literature stuff that shows up, the, the preterist view. But that's kind of a sidebar. All right. Now, we have then the premillennial view, which says that Christ will return, he establishes his kingdom, and he rules on his earthly throne for 1,000 years. And where is his earthly throne located? Jerusalem, of course. All right. And then all the other stuff happens around it, and it gets a little bit thick to say the least, okay? So you've got the secret rapture, then you've got the seven years of tribulation, then it really ratchets up, and then you have the little season, and then you have the millennial reign of Christ, then you have the first resurrection, then you have another resurrection, then you have the second rebellion, where the satanic hordes rise up again, then you have the meeting of all the countries coming together, and they meet in the Armageddon, Armageddon, the valley, and then there's the big battle, and Michael comes and trashes them all, and the big nuclear explosion happens, and everything's wiped out, and Rush is done, and you know, it gets really, really confusing. And then, finally, we have the last judgment, and now, finally, we get to go into the whole deal, the final ending. And you'll notice on page 45, every one of the charts starts the same and ends the same. It's all the stuff in between that gets all messy. Okay, it's just well, how we go in between. All right, that's the premillennial view. A postmillennial view is what? Yes. The church establishes the thousand-year kingdom, and after the thousand years are done, then Christ will return. All right. So God is at work through his church and in his people, establishing the thousand-year reign now, and the thousand-year reign begins, and then at the culmination of those thousand years of idyllic, peaceful reign, Christ appears in his full glory. So the post means the appearing of Christ is after the millennium has been established. Okay? So that's the post-millennial view, and that would put it, have the thousand-year reign, it's all great, everything's wonderful, and then Christ returns, all right? Then the amillennial view is what? The amillennial view says there is no literal thousand-year reign where you tick off 365,000 periods of those. That's not what we're looking for. The amillennial view would say this is not our hope. Our hope is Christ's return, and that's it. So we're not looking for Christ to reign in this world for a thousand years. And there's really good scripture for that. My kingdom is not of this world. Hmm, boy, that's pretty clear cut there too. And so you, you talk about your clear cuts, Coleman. That's pretty clear cut. But, and that would be the, the amillennial view. All right, now just real quickly, where's our position? We are number four. We're amillennial. So are we in the minority of Christians on this? No! We are in the solid majority because who else is a millennial? Rome is. Thank you. Once Rome's with us, we're done. We win. You know, they're, they're, they, got the, they got the whole majority. So this is the amillennial view, and this is frankly the view of a lot of Christians. A lot of Presbyterians would hold this view. A lot of Episcopalians would hold this view. I think solid Calvinists would hold this view. It's the um, nutcase evangelicals who get up into the, the weirdnesses. Now, postmillennial we'll talk about more in just a minute. I was going to say, I actually had a question on postmillennial. Okay, so that one's... 
So Christ comes and then... No, no, no. So the post-millennial view is that the world is progressing and progressing and progressing, and then at some point, we actually start the millennial period. Okay, and the, the things are just getting better and better and better. And then at the end of this thousand year reign of just incredible prosperity and wonderful peace and everything, then Christ will return and we'll see him full blast. That's the post millennial view. Now, let's just talk about this a little bit historically. So historically, I've said there are all of these views way back already in the time of the early church. In the patristics, you can read these kinds of things going on and there's already some debates. And we'll get into more about why they would have different views of these kinds of things. And the good stuff in the document about you know, our interpretation of especially the whole problem of the apocalyptic literature and what to do with this stuff. And the document handles that pretty well. We'll get there. But these are there. Now, in the more recent history, which is where I'm more interested in anyway, and this has, because this has bearing exactly on where we are today, not going all the way back to, to, to the patristics, but in the last couple of centuries, all right, in the 19th century, all right, you've got the Enlightenment going really strong. Things are going gangbusters, and they're just, you know, steam locomotives and medicine and communication and all these kinds of discoveries. And we're starting to just make some real strides and cities are these shiny, gleaming places that everybody wants to live and it's awesome. And we're having these comfortable lives. And so in this time period, the post-millennial view was exceedingly popular. And around the turn of the last century, we're talking around 1900, the post-millennial view was the dominant view in the church. All right. And you even had a lot of mainstream people, you know, you good Presbyterians and even probably a lot of Lutherans who are talking about, yeah, you know, it looks like we're in that millennial kingdom. And people were venturing to put dates on it. You know, when did it when do we start it? And they're trying to, you know, figure out when did it start it? Or maybe we're there, we're getting real close. And there was pretty pretty good confidence. So that by the time you get into the early part of the twentieth century, you know, that first decade there, it, things are just going really well, you know. And it's looking really promising. You have the whole Gilded Age at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th. And so the post-millennial view, there's a lot of adherence, and they're making a pretty good case. It's looking like it, all right? But then historically, we have a few glitches, all right? Uh, first little snag is World War I, okay? But even that, there's some optimism about that because that's supposed to be the war to end all wars. You know, that's how it gets sold, and that's the, that's the tag everybody puts on it. And there's actually some confidence there, too. Um, Wilson's got his League of Nations cooked up. Wilson would be a great post-millennial kind of guy. I mean, he, he would be there. And, in fact, um, our SMP guys, um, Maxwell dug this stuff out in one of the courses. Um, there are actually politicians like, I think, Coolidge or, you know, Wilson. In some of their speeches, you read their stuff, and it's post-millennial like crazy. You know, they're just talking about, here we have arrived. This is the Christian time. We are, we are doing this. And there's just this bold confidence and these bold declarations. And there's this optimism. We're there. We're doing it. And it was just, it was grabbed into the whole nation, the whole America. You know, this, we're the shining city in the hill. We're part of this. We're making this thing happen. So there was the confidence we're still going to pull it off, even after World War I. And then the Great Depression hits, and that's a bummer. Boy, it's getting harder to believe. And then World War II explodes, and everything starts to unravel. And then you have the horrors that come out of that, you know, the realization of the, the genocide that's going on. And then you have continuing genocide happening under the Soviet Union and the hegemony there. And then you've got more horror going on in Southeast Asia and then into Africa. So then by the time you get through the 20th century, you know, three quarters of the way through, people are just saying, whoa, post-millennial, you got to be kidding. No. Eh, no chance. And so post-millennialism has fallen on very hard times. And to find anybody who actually holds this view, is, you're, you're hard-pressed to find anyone who holds this view. But 100 years ago, 110 years ago, this was the dominant position. So it's kind of funny how, you know, theology has fads. But it was based very much on the history and what's going on in the society. So that was that, the view. So that was the, the dominant position. And there, the millennial, the post-millennial and the amillennial, there's some commonalities here, actually, in many ways. You know, we're not looking for secret raptures. We're not looking for, you know, Christ to be reigning in Jerusalem anytime soon. And so there's a lot of commonalities. So you can be amillennial and kind of post-millennial and kind of get along pretty well. But when the post-millennial visions just crashed with the realities of the 20th century, then the amillennial became far more dominant because you could see clearly the difference, okay? Because the amillennial is a little more sober about things, you know? Come on, this world's broken, it's messed up. We get that. We're not looking for any kind of thousand-year reign here in, in beyond what we already have in the church's presence in the gospel. That's what we've got. So we're not looking for more. So this became far more kind of like 
back again to what this should be. But the premillennials, especially the dispensational premillennials, they rose up in a sense in contrast to this because there was so much optimism here and this was kind of often seen as a liberal position. And so you had a lot of the dispensationalists who were trying to be the more faithful Bible believers. They really grabbed onto this kind of premillennial stuff, and this grew out of, especially out of the Schofield Reference Bible, okay, so maybe with the, and the Darby stuff is, you know, the early, 20, late 19th into the early 20th century, and he's the one who kind of just really set the stage here, and the Schofield Reference Bible became the thing that just grabbed on and really took off, and that is the bedrock of the premillennial stuff, okay? So you're getting the historical kind of setting here a little bit? Yes. Is this in part reactionary <coughs> to historical critical? Like, is there an influence of how they're looking at the scriptures in much more <coughs> Yes, definitely. More than... Because one of the one of the hallmarks of the premillennialists is they are going to read a literal Bible. You know, and they're not going to figuratively play games. They're not going to demythologize it. They're not going to go for any of that stuff, even though this is before Boltman. They're not going to, they're, oh, no, they're not going to play games. They're not, they're not buying into this wellhouse and stuff. You know, the whole JEDP, that's starting to happen. They're pushing against this. And this is our Bible. This is God's Word. And if God's Word says it, that's it. And this becomes one of their hallmarks. Because, see, we read the Bible seriously. And, of course, that's been their downfall because they don't distinguish the kind of literature they're reading. They're reading the Apocalypse of St. John exactly like they're reading the Gospel of St. John. And reading that like they're reading the Epistle of Ephesians or like they're reading Psalms. They're reading them all the same way. And then you end up with idiocy, which continues to this day among Bible-believing Christians who just read it all flat the same. That's a big part of the problem. But you're right. They, they champion this as we're not liberals. We're not selling out our Bible. We take it seriously. But by taking it seriously, they mean literal, and they're proud of that, but then becomes a literalistic, which is not paying attention to the genre, and you need to. All right? Good? Now, I do want to call your attention to one thing. We're, the key is trying to have, figure out how to take this stuff we're getting today and kind of integrating it along a little bit. And there's one really confusing term on page 7. Because here the document says, this is the top of the page, an eschatology which does not teach a literal thousand-year earthly reign of Christ may be called amillennialist, sometimes realized millennialism. Um, because the period spoken of in Revelation 20 is now in the process of realization. Now the problem we have there is realized millennialism sounds a lot like realized eschatology, which is one of Long's terms, but they are not the same thing at all. Okay, so don't get confused by this. And this is a real, real snag and not helpful because realized, when Long talked about it, was the liberal view of kind of the post-millennialists, this is it. We're in it now. This is as good as it's going to get. Let's keep on working to make it better. That was the realized eschatology. There's nothing more coming. So the realized eschatology of Long was fighting against the futurist eschatology of someday we'll get there. No, 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 this is it. And so Long was contrasting realized eschatology with future eschatology and trashing them both. And then he also trashed the demythologized eschatology, and then he wants to have the future present kick in. Remember that? Okay, that was class period ago or so. All right. I know. Distant far back. You haven't studied yet. Um, but the realized millennialism here is really saying, no, the millennium is happening in the life of the church. It's been happening since Christ rose, and this 2,000 years of church history is the millennial period of Christ's presence in the world. Okay, that's, that's the realized millennialism. So don't get it mixed up here, because realized millennium, okay. Realized eschatology, not okay. You getting that? Okay, good. Yeah, Julian. Yeah. Between a millennium and post millennium, right? Because they see the millennium differently as well. Like, so, a millennium, we'd say more of a spiritual reign of Christ in his church. Post millennium, they'd say it's more of a physical. This is some truth to this, but you see, even the post-millennials will vary on that. Some of them are going to be far more connected with a spiritualized, even reign. Others are looking for a more of a set up the throne, here we go. But probably a lot of the people here are going to be much more content to spiritualize it or not take it in a literal way. And I don't want to say spiritualize, but just stay, to read it in an, as in a metaphor rather than as a literal fulfillment. Yeah. Okay? All right. Good? So that's kind of the overview entry into this. Now, what goes into the document next, which is part two, is, so what accounts for these differences? And these are pretty radical differences, all right? Because the premillennial view is, is pretty, pretty different than the amillennial view, 
to say the least, all right? There are some radical differences here. Because here, you're looking for the rapture of Christ, of the Christians, and you're looking for, you know, the chance to get out of here, and then the tribulation to start, and all kinds of different things. Whereas here, basically we're saying, Christ can come back at any minute. These guys, no, he can't. The rapture has to happen first. So that's the first thing they're watching for, is when it's going to happen. And there are the clues. Um, and there's a, an entire industry built up around this. You'll hear about um, end times conferences. Anybody ever been to one of those? You won't admit it. All right. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is having a, a thing on it. All right. Like yeah, Seventh-day Adventists are notorious for this. Almost all your evangelicals are, are the same. They held end times conferences. They were more the rage probably two or three decades ago. Um, during the Cold War, these things were really popular. And they had a lot of these end times conferences. And they would debate with each other. Are you a mid-trib -trib rapture, pre-trib rapture, post-trib rapture? And they were distinctions within the dispensationalists. And they would argue about things and fight with things. Um, my roommate in college had this end times poster, which he was making fun of, but we had it on our dorm room and covered three or four walls going all the way around and it had all the artwork of all the things that were going to happen and when they were going to happen and everything and it's, it's crazy and people just got really invested in this. Now, why? Why the big differences? The document, I think, helps us understand this. So there are, first of all, some hermeneutical considerations and this is probably the biggest point and they, he ticks off in the document here, if I recall, seven different reasons why we've got these differences hermeneutically. And a nice list of seven, rhetorically complete and satisfying. So this is, we need to pay attention to this. These are important. And I would argue this is probably the most important answer to give to people. And they start asking, now what's going on here? Um, why are these differences? And your people are going to be hungry for answers on this stuff. Because they've got friends who believe in the dispensational stuff. They've got friends who are premillennialists, and, and their friends are shocked when they find out that your Lutherans don't know anything about this stuff. So your people are going to want to know about things. I was hounded relentlessly in the parish to teach a Bible class in Revelation. Teach a Bible class in Revelation all the time. You know, I finish up a Bible class. What do you guys want to do next? Revelation! Ugh, I ignored it and blew them off for years. No, I'm not doing Revelation. And finally, I just got tired. I said, we'll do it. Finally, we'll do it. So I just cranked through Revelation. I said, there, I've done it once and never again. And I stuck to that. Um, so I'm not going to do it again. But your people, just they are just eager, eager, eager for answers. So you've got to set the stage for them. And the first thing to do is you set the stage hermeneutically. Julian. So this seems to be all pivotal around the thousand year reign in Revelation. Around the what? It's, it's kind of rotating around the thousand year reign yeah. in Revelation. It just seems kind of counterintuitive to me, seeing as it's, you know, anti that Usually we interpret those as right. the rest of Scripture. So right. it just seems like that's strange that that is the one thing. Well, that's true as well, and this goes back to Coleman's point. The people who would hold on to this don't even know what antilogomena means. They wouldn't even... <laughs> what do you mean? It's in the Bible. And for them, Bible's Bible. And they're not going to make any distinctions. They're not going to, and they wouldn't do that. So that's part of the problem there as well. But it's not just the apocalypse. You've got the little apocalypse in the Gospels in Matthew, where Jesus is talking. You've got some stuff in Daniel. You've got some stuff in Ezekiel. Right, but none of them describe a thousand year reign. Right, right, right. No, that's right. That's right. This becomes kind of the linchpin of stuff. You're right. All right. Now, so the hermeneutical considerations. So we need to take into account, first of all, the nature of prophetic and apocalyptic literature. This is the very first point they're making. And I have likened it this way. And this illustration is in here, but I think it was pretty helpful. It's important to remember that when you're reading apocalyptic literature, which is what the book of Revelation is, which is why I like to call it the Apocalypse of St. John, rather than even the book of Revelations. And it's not plural, all right? Um, it's like Psalms, Psalms 1. Ugh, you know, people, so it would be Psalm 1. All right, but anyway, those are just little pet peeves I have. Um, Psalms 23, I love favorite psalm. You know, I remember favorite psalms. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Just blow them off. Now, so it's the Apocalypse of St. John. Now, about apocalyptic literature. The first thing to recognize is this is apocalyptic literature. This is a particular kind of literature which was very popular during the time of the Second Temple of Israel. And it was uh, thick. Why? Whenever things get really bad for the, for the believers, this literature kind of revives because people are kind of freaking out. You know, oh man, we're on the ropes. It's hard. But wait a minute, who's in charge? God is. God's going to win. Rome's going down. You know, or Antiochus Epiphanes is going down. And so the apocalyptic literature 
pops up at these times, so it's not a surprise. Now, what's common with apocalyptic literature is these fanciful images, these crazy number kinds of things, and a lot of this kind of forward-looking stuff. This is not to discount the reality of the message given, but it is to recognize apocalyptic literature is conveying truth in a very imaginary, figurative way. That's how it works. And now there's an art illustration that helps here, I think, a lot. It's like when you go to the museum and you're looking at the different paintings and you see a Rembrandt, which is very realistic. People say, oh, I like that. It looks like what it's supposed to look like. Then you go into the next room and you've got Van Gogh's and it's Impressionism. And now you've got the painting of a starry night. And you see these swirling things up in the skies. People say, stars don't look like that. Or you have a painting of the sunflowers and you've got these bursts of color, you know, and people say, I don't look like a sunflower. I don't like that. You know? And so I'm going back to Rembrandt. Okay, fine, go. Um, but you see, the, the point is, what Van Gogh is painting is not what it looks like, but what it feels like. It's the impression you get. And when you let your mind go a little bit and relax and say, hey, this dude is seeing stuff that's awesome, and there's something compelling about this, and you realize there's a greater truth behind the imagery, it's kind of cool. And it, it's a blast just to enjoy that for what it is. I think apocalyptic literature should be looked at that, like that. It's like impressionistic art. And if you look at it, see now, if you look at a Van Gogh and press him hard, come on, some flowers don't grow like that. You know, you're missing the whole point. You, you dummy, you, this is, he's not a realist. Stop it, okay? And you're, you're, you're missing everything. But if you press him into a realist mold, everything gets all messed up. And it's the same thing with apocalyptic literature. It's not straight history. It's Impressionism. And if you press it into the wrong mold, you're going to get all messed up. You're going to be all goofed up. You're going to be looking for helicopters looking like hornets or locusts. And you're going to be thinking nukes are being described here and pale horses are, you know, this image. And you're going to be, you're going to be identifying Gog and Magog with Russia and Assyria or Syria. And you're going to be all messed up. So just knock it off. What's that? Jesus, like the lamb, right? the lamb. Yeah, yeah, you get all this stuff. And the seven horns, you know, this just gets nuts. And so you just got to back off and let it happen. So the best way to read the apocalyptic literature is just read it and see what it feels like. Wow, that kind of freaked me out. Good. And uh, wow, that was kind of cool. Good. Okay, we're done with that. Next one. Now let's go back to something like Romans. Or let's go back to Mark. Okay. And now we're on solid ground again. And we'll read that a little differently. So you've got to understand that. And that's probably the first biggest thing. And when I teach taught Revelation, I spent a long time stressing this to kind of get this basic hermeneutic move started. Because most of the nonsense comes, people don't take this into account. And they try to read the apocalypse like they're reading everything else. And they, they get messed up. And if you want, people say, now, wait a minute, aren't you kind of just playing fast and loose? Okay, well, then you tell me. In the Psalms, when it says, and the, ha the hills will clap their hands, what's that mean? So the hill is going to literally grow a pair of arms and start clapping? You know, look out. You know, is that what we're talking about? Come on. You know, very few Christians even hold a literalist view that far. Say, well, it's metaphorical. Precisely. So, why wouldn't the book of the Apocalypse also be metaphor, since that is exactly the content and the genre, that's how it operates. Let's read it the right way. Let's pay attention. And you're not reading against John, you're reading it exactly how John intended it to be read. That's the whole point. How did the author want this book to be read? Like apocalyptic, that's how you read it. So you got to be a little careful here. So that's the first point. Second point, we're on page 10, is this whole idea of the shortened perspective, or sometimes foreshortened, it's called. And the illustration here is very simple. So if you've been out west and you are looking at the mountain range on the horizon and you're seeing all the mountains, and if you're just looking at the mountains in the distance, how far do they all look? Pretty much all the same. All the peaks look the same. But then if you start identifying peaks and you look at an actual map, you might realize, oh, this one's 10 miles away. Well, this one's about 20 miles away. This one over here is 50 miles away. But I wouldn't know it to look at it. They all look the same. Okay? You get the idea? And if you were actually to look at it, you could realize, oh, there's actually a lot of space in between them. But when you're just kind of seeing it, it all looks like it's all flat, all the same two-dimensional. And this is used to illustrate the fact that in the prophetic literature, they will often look ahead to see things, and they'll see this, and they'll see this, and they'll see this, and they'll describe them as concurrent, when in fact they're at different points in God's linear unfolding of his plan. So you've got some things that are true of Christ's first coming. You've got some things that are true of the time of the church, and you've got some things that are not true until the second coming. And yet, the scriptures might talk about them all kind of at the same time. So, when the Prince of Peace comes, the Lamb and the Lion will lie down together. Well, we're, yeah, in process. 
a few thousand years in between, but we're there, we're getting there. And so that's the idea of the shortened perspective. So you can't press too hard when Isaiah or Joel or Daniel says something and makes a prophecy. And as the text points, and as the CTCR document points out, so in Joel's prophecy, he can go from the plague of the locust, which was a present reality, to the speaking in tongues, which is a Pentecost fulfillment, to the great day of the Lord, which is an end times fulfillment. And it's all happening in the space of a verse or two. And boom, boom, boom. It's all happening once because they have that shortened perspective. Okay? So that's really helpful as well. All right, good. Third point is <coughs> the interpreter, this is the bottom of 10. The New Testament indicates this prophet is ultimately realized in the promise of the people of God, all believers of the church will be saved. Um, and so we have the idea of the historical times coloring. In other words, we, we can't read the text anachronistically. So, well, Daniel never says anything about the church. That's because there was no word church. Okay, it's kind of obvious, but that's the whole point, all right? And so that's just the thing. So you, you, we have to have the historical times coloring. So when Obadiah is making a prophecy about the people of God, well, it didn't say the church, so that's not what he meant. He meant that. He just didn't use the word because I didn't have the word, okay? Ecclesia didn't exist yet in his context. So that's all we're saying there. All right, fourth point is the whole idea of typology and an type and antitype. And this I hope you have covered in your hermeneutics class or somewhere along the way, right? Okay, type or anti-type. And what we're talking about here is the idea that you have a historical reality, either an event or a person, which actually happens in history and it's real. Then you have the fulfillment, which comes later also in history, but it takes the type and it explodes it or shifts it or makes it bigger and completes it. That's the idea of type and to type. Now, when I was a student here, this was a raging debate. And maybe you encountered this a little bit in some of your stuff because there were those in the church who said, nope, all prophecy is strictly rectilinear. Okay? And so you had the debate between rectilinear prophecy, which is where you have this is going to happen, and then the fulfillment. Don't read too much into the sounds of the homonyms here. All right? And so <clears throat> you have the rectilinear prophecy, and even though there's, there's some anal retentive aspects to this. Um, and so, can't resist. So the rectilinear guys were saying, you know, if it's not a prophecy, then it's not a prophecy. Well, the typology guys and the rectilinear guys, strict ones that say the only types in the Bible are the ones that are identified as types. So you have Adam and the new Adam, and that's about it, and a couple others, and there's maybe seven in the entire Bible. Well, then you have the guys like Horace Hummel people, which means everybody on this campus, okay, have all been influenced by Hummel and his work, and now he's become quite pervasive. And Hummel saw types everywhere. And this is what he taught me. And so, you know, you see a type here and you see something happening in the Old Testament, then the New Testament fulfills it. Wow, this typology. And it just sees it going on all over the place. I see it this way. And that's how I tend to read scripture. And that's how I preach. That's how I do the Old Testament in a very typological way. And I think it's on the right track. You always have to be a little careful not to press too hard and say that this is the one fulfillment of this. Maybe it's a fulfillment. Maybe there's more to come. We'll see. That's kind of cool about the fulfillments. Now, the thing to remember here, though, the, the most helpful part of the type antitype is once you're to the antitype, you're done with the type. You're not going back. So now that we've got a new Adam, Jesus, how interested are we in the first Adam? Anybody want him to come back again and start doing his thing again? No, thanks. I've got Jesus. I don't need Adam. I got the real Adam. I don't want the first one. So now the same thing holds with the whole Israel. Israel is a type for what? The church, the ecclesia, now we had God's chosen people, the Jews. Now who are God's chosen people? All races, all tribes together is God's people. So the new Israel is the church. Whoa! Now that we've got that, are we interested in trying to rehabilitate the first Israel? No. And see, this is exactly what the dispensationalists will do. Okay? We've got different rules for different people, and we'll get more onto the criticism of this in a minute. All right. Right now, I'm just trying to give you the picture. I'm not attacking it too hard, but there are big problems with this. So then one more clear example is even the land of Israel, because the land of Israel enters heavily into apocalyptic literature and heavily into dispensational stuff. All right. Big time. So the land of Israel. Well, what's the if that's the type, what's the antitype fulfillment of the land of Israel? Well, it becomes God, him, Christ himself. Christ himself present in the people. This is where God is. This is God's chosen place. Or you can even go with the idea of the promised land of the eschatological fulfillment, the new heavens and new earth. That's the new Israel. And I think that's even the greatest fulfillment. So Christ is the fulfillment of this. But the point is, if we've got the new 
the new Israel, the new land, God's promised land, the recreated heavens and earth, why are we interested in this plot of real estate in Palestine? Oh, sorry, the Holy Land. Um, and because I made a mistake one time with my Zionist people in my congregation, I had a couple of them, of using the term Palestine, and they went flipping out on me because it's Palestine, it's Israel, <sighs> whatever. And so, because they, they, were, they were Zionists. They, they would spend their summers working in Israel, volunteering in the army and the, and the hospitals, and you know, they were gung-ho. In fact, this is an interesting story because they came to me and just chastised me for not getting Israel right and not honoring Israel because they were reading all this dispensational stuff. And I said, no, I'm reading it right, sorry. And I'm not going to change this. They said, well, we can't stay in the church. I said, fine, go. So they left the church and went looking for a new church. And they were gone for several years. Then they came back. And they said, well, we've been looking everywhere. I said, yeah. And um, we found churches that teach what we teach, what we believe about Israel. I said, yeah, but they don't have the sacraments. Yeah, I know. And um, we really missed that um, because they'd grown up Catholic, one of them had. And we really missed that. I said, yeah, I bet you do. Um, can we come back? I said, well, have you changed your mind? Well, not really. We still think Israel is Israel. I said, okay, are you willing to be quiet about it? Yeah. So you willing to be taught? Yeah. Okay, you can come back. And so they came back and they were happy and my members again and never said anything about Israel anymore. So it was just fine. <laughs> so there's an example of a little pastoral care. You see, you don't, they, don't, they don't have to believe everything. They just have to be willing to say, I'll follow your lead on this and I'm not going to stir things up. And I was content with that. So Anyway, that's, this is, you don't go back to the type once the antitype fulfillment has come. We don't mess around with the, the figures. So if you've got the fulfillment, why are you messing around with shadows? Is that, that's kind of the idea, okay? So I think that's very, very helpful. All right, then the um, fifth point they get to, uh, let's see, now where does this one come in? I don't know if I had this one marked. Oh, there we go, page 13. The fifth point is the Christological focus of Scripture, so we recognize Christ is in everything. That's cool. And this is where it says this clear-cut middle of page 13. Now that the antitype has come, one cannot expect a reestablishment of the type. Exactly. And then sixth is Christ is the new Israel. Israel reduced to one. And what's interesting is here is how about the, about the four, five, and six of these are all really all about typology. And they're just fleshing them out more specifically. Christ is Israel reduced to one. Got the great graph on page 14. You know, you have heard that one ad nauseum in your classes, right? Israel reduced to one is Christ and you have this focusing down to Christ becomes the new perfect Israel. God will have his obedient son. He gets it in Christ and then Christ f spreads out into the new creation of his church. And so now we have Israel is us, you and me, God's church and all, all of humanity pulled back into this. And then the sixth point finally, or the seventh point wrapping all this up, on six is the land of Israel prefigures Christ and ultimately the new heavens and the new earth, not the geographical limitations. So as I said, the typology antitype is the huge mark here. And really, points five, six, and seven are all just aspects of this one main point. But they're all so important, they get their own set point. Besides, you need seven to be rhetorically pleasing. All right, so you just do it any way you can. All right, good? Tracking with me on this? Yes. I just have a question about apocalyptic genre. Yeah. How do we couch what that means? Is that in uh, non-biblical sources, or is that from... No, this is, this is, I would say, this comes probably from our understanding. See, it's not like we're imposing this stuff. I would say it really comes internally. It's, it's really the literature itself proves this. For example, how many of us are actually inclined to read the book of Psalms like we read the book of Matthew? I mean, Psalms are different. They're songs, for crying out loud. They're poetry. And everybody knows, you learned this as a kid. When you start reading poetry, the rules change. You know, metaphor run, runs the show, and literalism is thrown out. You know, poetry is poetry, and we know it, and you know that. Now, does that mean poetry is a lie? Is it false? No, in fact, poetry can sometimes be more true than strict prose. That's the beauty of poetry. Poetry conveys stuff. Poetry communicates truth. So the, I would say the text itself tells you how to read it. So when you're reading Psalms, you realize, oh, I'm reading poetry. Oh, I'm reading Isaiah. Oh, I'm reading poetry. I should read it accordingly. Right. I'm reading apocalyptic literature. Ah, oh, it's not really poetry. But it's not really prose either. This is apocalyptic. It's kind of a unique, unique thing. I need to read it accordingly. And the point I would make is that every one of John's readers would have known, oh, apocalyptic. Cool, from John. This is a blast. Let's go. And they would know exactly what to do with it. And we make the huge mistake of not knowing what to do with it. Okay? Good. All right, good, 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 good. Um, so then the, page 17, the doctrine of eschatology. And the term that um, this document likes, and I know that this is one of Robbie's favorites, is he likes the term of inaugurated eschatology. And this is essentially this document's synonym for the phrase that long had of future present. So inaugurated eschatology and future present eschatology are really the same piece. Okay? Because inaugurated means what? 
It's here. Christ has come. It's, it's begun. Is it full blast? Not yet. It's, it's off and running. The clock is ticking in a sense. Everything's in place and, and the, 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 pro, the plan is happening. It's unfolding. But we're not there yet. There's an end to come, but we're on the way. And what's the classic way to define this? You all know this one? Now, not yet. Exactly. Okay. Now, not yet. And that shows up on page 19. And so we have then this idea we're in this inaugurated eschatology. It's begun. We're coming there. It's, it's happening. And then he has A through G, all these points. We have a future Redeemer coming, the kingdom of God, the new covenant, the restoration of Israel, upwelling the Spirit, the day of the Lord. All these things point to why this is the way we understand this. And this is the idea of the now it is here, but not yet completely. So are we in the kingdom of Christ? Yes. Do you have eternal life? Yes. Do you have complete victory over all sin? Not yet. Do you have victory over death? Not yet. But I do have victory over death. Now, not yet. That's the tension we're living in. It's this in-between time. And inaugurated captures this rather nicely. So it has begun, and we're in process, and it will certainly be fulfilled, but it's not there all the way yet. It's inaugurated. And that's the term that's used here. And I really would argue this is exactly the same thing Long's trying to get at with his future present the same exact move, and now not yet. And the reason you have this variation in terminology is because no one is kind of like owns the waterfront on this. Everybody's kind of, it's not like there's one systematically accepted, here's the term we're going to use. It's not like, okay, we're all going to agree on Trinity? Okay, we're all good here. We haven't come to kind of final agreement on these things yet. You know, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, maybe the church will all be using the same language. Maybe inaugurated will win, or maybe future present will win, who knows. But right now, all these terms are kind of floating around out there. Even, you know, like, realized millennialism, that kind of flows in there. So just think carefully through what you mean by your terms so you can kind of keep things straight. All right. So we have this now, but are there things yet to come? Yeah. So is there a strong future eschatology as well? Sure. That's why it's future present. There are some things that haven't happened yet. There will be great tribulation. There will be an antichrist who will rise up. This is going to happen. There will be a beast, and this is going to happen. Now, when it happens... Will we know what's happening? Maybe, maybe not. When you'll know it happens is when Christ returns, you'll say, oh, there's the beast. Now we all know. In retrospect, it's clear cut. But I'm not convinced that at the time, everybody's going to be able to say, this is it. There he is. I saw 666 on his forehead. It's a given. You know, like the old B-rated horror movies or the B-level horror movies from the late 20th century. You know, the, you ever watch Damien Omen movies? Yeah, you, so you push back the kid's hairline. He's got 666 literally on his forehead. You know, there you have fulfillment. He's really the beast. All right. So we, the signs are going to be there, but we're not always going to be sure of which ones they are until after the kind of retrospect after the fact. All right, so that's that. Um, the papacy, and so we're talking about the Antichrist now. And so does the papacy fit the definition of Antichrist? Answer is yes. And the, script, the confessions are very clear on this, especially in their time period. They wanted to make this point very strongly. The document rightly notes there's a difference between the papacy as Antichrist and individual holders of the, of the office. They could actually be followers of Christ and be saved. That's possible, even though Pieper doubts it. Um, this document's a little more optimistic about the possibility, mostly because it's written with John Paul II, the Pope. And He's kind of cool. And so people like him a little bit better than the people liked his popes. And so but the Antichrist is clearly a scriptural teaching. I think it's also very helpful to sometimes be clear about the articles you put on this. And I think it's nice to sometimes recognize that even in scripture, Antichrist shows up in a plural, that there are Antichrists those who are opposed to Christ. And we might maybe be better off talking about individual or a person being an antichrist. And so then we don't have to kind of pin it down to the one antichrist, but there are many antichrists who are setting themselves up in opposition to Christ. And who will the ultimate antichrist be? Well, when Christ returns, then we'll know. And we'll have it figured out. In the meantime, it's probably just smart to recognize the antichrists that appear and resist them when they're trying to deceive God's people. All right, good? Okay, good. Resurrection of the body, we've already hit that pretty hard, so we don't need to worry about that too much. Then we have this whole rapture discussion. So in answer to your friend, Brian, do we believe in a rapture, and what is our answer? Sure, but what do we mean when we talk about a rapture? We talk about the passage where it says, and the saints, those who are resurrected, will be caught up with Christ into the clouds and return with him in glory. And so how we would interpret this is, it's sort of like the um, practice you had in the time of St. Paul and in the early church, when a dignitary was coming to a city, you would have a welcoming committee go out to meet him. 
and then they would come into the city with him. And this even happened to St. Paul. Remember when he finally made it to Rome, there were a bunch of the Roman citizens, the Roman Christians, who went out of the city and met him. And then they greeted him before he even got to the city, and then they came into the city with him. This was standard practice in the ancient world. You would go out to meet the guy of, of high renown and come in with him. So the idea is, in Christ's return, his people will go up and meet him and then return with him. And so that's, that's the extent of the rapture. And so when the, when's the rapture going to happen? On the last day, and that's it. And it's not seven years separated or a thousand years separated. It's just part of the return of Christ, that God's people will meet him and celebrate with him and return and glory with him. That's the sense of it. And that's how we would read that. So when you have the text in Matthew, you know, two men will be walking up a hill, one will disappear, one will be left there. Oh, there's the rapture. Fine. And what's really going on there is the suddenness of this and the, the quickness of this. And don't overread this into, oh, this is the seven year rapture being described in the premillennial rapture. You're reading way too much into it. It's simply, in the context, is the suddenness of this and the need to be alert and be ready because you never know when Christ will return. That's the real point. All right, good? All right, the materiality of the new creation really gets pressed hard, which is quite good, like that. And then they get into some of the contested scriptures, spend a lot of time on the all Israel stuff. And then we have an excursus on the Jews, that's all fine. And we go to page 42, where we're going to get into the dispensational premillennials a little bit more. All right, any questions between here and there? All right, contentment rules, this is very nice. All right, now, so what's wrong with dispensational premillennialism? There are so many things, where do you begin? <laughs> Brian. I just say the thing that I like that they pointed out was they, there's multiple resurrections and Jesus never talks about that. All right. Jesus does not talk about multiple resurrections, okay? No That's one, true. No one in the Bible does. Correct. No one does. In fact, on pages 42 to 43, there are 11 points of problems with the dispensationalists, and they don't even go to some of the most basic ones, okay? The most basic one was mentioned earlier in the document when they first introduced everything, and this is this whole idea of dispensations. And I want to hit this a little bit hard, because this shows up even in our own people's minds sometimes, and I even hear Lutherans talking this way sometimes, and it's really troubling to me. So, uh, the fundamental idea of the dispensationalist, what do they mean by dispensation anyway? What's his name? What's, his, what's going on here? Yeah, Brad. So that God deals with his people differently? Throughout. Yeah, that the rules change. So there are different ways that God operated. And so dispensationalists have seven, of course, dispensations. There's the dispensation of Adam, so before the fall. Then there's one of after the fall. Then there's one of the promise. Then there's the one of command. And there's one of grace. And then there's the dispensation of the end, final end times. So they have all these dispensations. So the, the key thing is they're trying to figure out how to read the scriptures in ways that make sense. And they use the dispensations to kind of get around some sticky stuff. So in the Old Testament, does it look like you're saved by doing sacrifices? Okay, that's the sacrificial dispensation. There. And the, the, but the real problem is this. The problem is this whole idea that the rules change. So Adam was saved because he was a perfect man. Moses was saved because he kept the rules. David was saved because of this. So they have different rules for different times. And then this shows up in some crazy stuff. Where like the rules for Jews are different than they are for Gentiles. And this is still held by these people and by a lot of evangelicals, which is why they don't worry about evangelizing Jews. Yeah, they're fine. God's got a different plan for them. And they believe this. And so, in other words, there's different, different ways of getting saved. This is hugely problematic. Because what is the core of our whole teaching is the sufficiency of Christ. And you've got things like John 14. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Asterisk, for my dispensation only. Where does it say that? You know, that, that's, that's abhorrent because, and the, this is the real kicker in dispensationalism. I want you to recognize this. When you start having different rules for different times, you are diminishing Christ. Christ is good for one of the dispensations, or for a couple maybe, but he's not needed for everybody. And so, you Gentiles need Jesus. Jews have a different route. What are you doing? You're, you're trashing Christ. He's, he's not everything. He's not the sufficiency. He's not the center of the Old Testament. He's not the fulfillment of everything. He is not the way, the truth, and life for everyone. Just for a few. That's patently wrong. That's a huge problem. You're running Christ down. That's the biggest issue for me of all. Now, why this matters is you start getting this even in Lutheran audiences. You know, well, in the Old Testament, they were saved by their works. Because you know, the Old Testament, it was, they were saved because they kept they did the sacrifices. We're New Testament believers. We get grace. You ever heard that? That's dispensationalism. It is. 
It's a, it's a mild form of this because they're suggesting that Old Testament believers earned their salvation. We don't have to anymore. Is that true? Did the Old Testament believers earn their salvation? Has, any, has anybody ever earned their salvation? No. Just put it, think about this, people. Back up. Think theologically for a minute. Don't get trapped in your old ways of thinking. Has anybody ever earned their way into God's presence? No. You only get there by God's grace. Right? So we are only ever right with God through Christ. Either anticipating the promise and trusting the promise, or trusting what has already been accomplished and the deed done. Christ is the center. You and I live this side of the cross. We look back and we say, I'm trusting Christ. David and Moses lived on this side of the cross. They look forward and they're saying, I'm trusting the promise, the Messiah is coming. And the trust in God's grace given through the promise, that's what saves us all. And the Old Testament sacrificial system was not a separate means of salvation. It was just the means of grace for the Old Testament believers. On the same par as Lord's Supper and Baptism for us. So we're saved through the Lord's Supper and Baptism no more than they were saved through doing the sacrificial system. That was just the means that God established to deliver grace to His people. That's what it was in the OT. In the New T, we've got the means of grace, but it's all focused on the promise and the fulfillment of Christ. Now, Christ comes, and we see things more clearly, and this is cool, but He's not setting aside a works-righteous salvation now for a grace-based one. It's always been grace all the time, all the way back. And I would argue even Adam before the fall is not righteous quorum Deo because of his good actions. He's righteous quorum Deo because he lives as a creature trusting his creator. That's the key. It's always the trust relationship. That's consistent all the way through. No dispensations, trusting God's mercy in Christ. That's always the ticket. Okay, you getting this? Now that's a big deal to me. And to me, that's enough. You get that wrong, you're in serious, serious deep trouble. You are way out in the weeds. And are you even still Christian? And I've got serious concerns about this. And I get more concerned about this garbage than I worry about Roman Catholics. Far more. And you know, this is not typical either. We have, most of our people are really flipping out over Roman Catholics. Oh, they're so goofed up and all oh, my good Baptist friends. Spare me. These guys, especially the dispensational ones, what are they, what are they teaching? They are really diminishing Christ. Julian. This is a tangent, so I don't know if you actually want to answer it. It's kind of about the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Based on your comment of the continuity between the sacrifices and our sacrament now. Yeah. So I'm wondering why is it a big deal then? I mean, we've made a huge deal about not calling it a sacrifice. The, the sacrament yeah. now. Well, see, we... I mean, could, it, could we call it that? Yes. It's yes. And even the Book of Concord says this. Is there a sacrificial element to it? Absolutely. And the only reason we stay away from that is because of the mess the Roman made out of this, of the idea, I'm doing something with my sacrifice and earning favor. But the idea of this, this is the, the sacrifice of giving to God what he's given to me and recognizing that in this sacrificial meal, I'm receiving his grace, that's all fine. It's just that that language is really fraught with a lot of dangers because of what Rome has done with it. And that's why we avoid it. But no, the confessions acknowledge it, and it's, it's not a wrong way to look at it. Yeah, Kyle. So I realize there's a huge amount of diversity within the dispensationalist yes. paradigm, but um, would they be bothered by you pointing out um, generally that they're displacing Christ, or would they just say, well, that's a different um, dispensation? I think that they would probably tend to say, oh, we're not. We're Gentiles. We need him desperately. He's the only way. But then you press them, what about the Jews? Well, that's a different dispensation. Well, then what are you doing? And see, that's why you've got to help them realize what they're actually doing. If he's not really the Savior for all, what kind of Savior is he? What's going on? You know, who's really running the show here? Is it all about Christ or is it about your great plan? All right. Now, so then they got their 11 points here, and we don't need to hit all 11 of them, but it just ticks off all the problems that come. The next thing I do want to stress, though, is their first one is the tendency also with dispensational premillennialism is you're diminishing Christ, but you're also putting all of your eggs into a political basket. See, and this becomes all about the, poli the political reign, the political authority. Christ is going to reign in Jerusalem, in this land of Israel. And so it becomes very politically oriented, and it starts to get really hung up on the land. And some of you are very aware of the fact that the existence of Israel today is because of these guys. Did you realize that? 
because this all came out of the Balfour Declaration and all this stuff towards the end of the World, Second World War and all the lobbying that was going on. And there were some higher ups who were lobbying hard in England and it had Churchill's here. And they persuaded him that Israel needs to be reestablished as a separate nation so that we can get the cultists going again. And that's what their hope is. They want the sacrificial system going in Jerusalem because that's got to happen for all the stuff to start kicking in. And so Israel today exists because of this screwed up theology, which is remarkable. And this still, you know, how many evangelical churches do you see running around, you see it when you're driving around, especially in the South, where they've got the American flag, Christian flag, and the flag of Israel flying? Because, see, it's all running together for them. And, there are, and they are Zionists looking out for Israel because this is God's fulfillment. They're God's people. When in fact, Israel today is just a political mess created by post-World War II power brokers. What a mess. Palestinians are ripped off. There's no doubt about it. But now it's a mess because now we've got Israelis living there and Palestinians living there. Who gets it? Well, everybody. And it's, it's just a mess. Absolute mess. But what was, and the, the stupid idea was, we're going to reestablish the people of Israel and fulfill scripture. No, you're just going to create a problem. That's all you're doing. Uh, kind of a parallel question. This also prompts a lot of them to do evangelism. And I get, uh, who? My question, um, the. <coughs> oh, dispensationalists. Yeah. Okay. Because it's uh, when the gospel reached. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're, they're really eager to get this to speed up. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, on that. How do we react to, obviously the motivation is all messed up, wrong, but the, the that's when you take Christ's words, if you're not against me, you're for me. All right, so we'll cut him some slack, even though he said another time, if you're not with me, you're against me. So take your pick. So this time we'll be nice. Do the gospel. Great. Uh, we'll live with that. Yeah. For what, even Paul says this, you know, it doesn't really matter what reason they're, they're preaching. Yeah, do the gospel. Preach the gospel. And Paul says, I don't care what their motives are so long as Christ is being proclaimed. Yeah. All right, so we have this. Um, so then another aspect of this, so I've hit the political and the whole land thing and how people get hung up on this, this becomes a problem. Another aspect that you need to notice with the dispensationalists, and this comes through in here, is it becomes a very um, kind of self-protective sort of a thing. Because one of their big things is this whole rapture, and they're going to be able to escape the suffering. So, you know, when the suffering gets bad during the tribulation, I'm not going to be here. Good for me. And what, they're, what they very much want to avoid is any cross. The theology of the cross just doesn't work. So the theologian of glory is very much at home in dispensational theology. It fits because, hey, we're just getting all the glory. We're not going to go through that suffering. We're all going to be raptured out of there. And so too bad for all you suckers left down there. But that's not scriptural either. You know, so we walk the way of the cross. There is the way of suffering. So it's putting the hopes in the wrong places. It's, um, it's emphasizing the wrong things all over the place. And the... the Obviously, it contradicts the scripture, low view of the sacraments. This is all going full blast. So there are huge problems with dispensational millennialism, and you need to recognize this. So the amillennialists would say, simple, straightforward. Page 45, here's our chart. So what do we believe? There is the age of the church. We're in it. This is the thousand-year period in some sense. Or maybe the thousand-year period is on the far right end of the chart when God's finally got everything full blast. I can live with that too. So then there's this Satan's little season. And the document says, maybe we're in it now. Maybe it'll get worse. We'll see. Have things been bad before? Really bad. Luther was sure Christ was coming any day. He was sure of it. So was St. Paul. Okay. So was St. John. So, you know, this is not like it's a, you know, oh boy, in 2017, now, no one's ever seen this before. Yes, they have. Okay, so, you know, all the kinds of social ills we see, they've, we've been down this road before, done nothing new under the sun, you know, just get, get on with it. So Satan's little season will happen, Christ will come, and that's it. So what we're saying is, when, the, when Christ appears and comes, that's it. Done. That's all she wrote. And now we're into the full blast, full resurrection. One resurrection, one judgment, God's recreation, Done. New heavens, new earth, that's the goal. And so all the nonsense in between, like you get in the other the versions, no, we're not, we're not functioning with that. All right, good. Anything else in here? All right. How important is it to have your eschatology straight? Extremely important. I think so. Um, and sometimes we have the idea that eschatology only matters during Advent, and you have to preach on it three times and get on with it. Um, but you, you need to recognize eschatology is sort of the um, 
the marker for everything we do. And as I have been trying to stress with you, when you start getting your theology right, big picture, you've got creation at the front, you've got eschatology at the end, and it all ties together. Because eschatology is just the fulfillment of God's creation, putting things where he wanted and giving him the fulfillment of all. She had this beautiful tying it all together, and the center of it all is Christ crucified. So you've got to have your eschatology on the right track. It's, it's, it's important. All right, good? The other word we haven't used here, which I want to kick in, is the idea of hope. Because Paul says this is one of the greatest of Christian virtues. And we also we have, have trouble with this one, too. So we have faith, hope, and love. Um, and love is the greatest. But what about hope? Well, faith we're pretty good about as Lutherans. Hope thing we tend to not know what to do with. Um, and we tend to make it sort of a, kind of a, yeah, you've got to have hope. No, so we're not talking an Obama kind of hope here. We're talking about the absolute confident certainty of what God is going to do and the way that changes how you live. This has dramatic impact on real life day in and day out. So when you have the eschatological hope in Christ's recreation, it changes how you look at present day stuff. So you get a diagnosis of terminal cancer. You know, it doesn't crush you. It's, it's a bummer. It's horrible. And yet there's a hope that transcends this. And you have trials you're going through, you know, whatever it is, end of the quarter, trying to get papers on, oh, I'm going crazy here. Come on, get your perspective back. What's your hope? You know, you're living for the big picture here. Christ is coming. You know, well, who are you? You're God's child. Where do you fit in the big plan? I know where I fit. I see where I'm going. I see the fulfillment. This is cool. This is only for a little while. That's why St. Paul says, you know, our passing temporary problems. And if you want to have a list of problems, just look at Paul's list sometime. You know, beaten, stoned within his life a few times, you know, imprisoned. Good grief. Shipwrecked, snake bit. Paul had his problems. And so, you know, yours, yours don't quite qualify yet. Sorry. Um, but even he could say, eh, this passing light temporary things are nothing compared with the weight of glory. And C.S. Lewis talks about this beautifully as well. So just keep your perspective. And that's where the hope kicks in. And our hope is built on the eschatological reality of what Christ has done and is going to do. We need to be people who accentuate this and teach this. And this also generates kind of a almost giddy at times optimism. And this is something that I think is sorely lacking in way too many of our churches. We're just way too sober and melancholy and, oh, it's a horrible world out there. Oh, it's going to hell in a handbasket. Buckle, you know, bunker down. You've got to hunker down and really deal with things. Oh, it's bad. Do the liturgy because it's going to save us. You know, come on, people. You know, it's, let's just live with a little more embracing of the world and kind of, here, we're God's people. We're, we're on the winning side. It's all decided. We're, we're going to get the walk-off home run. It's going to be cool. And so in, enjoy it. And, and live with that confidence. It's, it's in the bag. And so we can have a kind of a giddy optimism and, and address things and without a dour hopelessness, but actually strong hope. And I would go so far as to say that Christians who are living in a hopeless kind of attitude are sinning. They're misrepresenting their Lord. They're not honoring Him. They're not being honest about who they are. And it needs to stop. All right, good. Anything else with this? All right, so I had you look at this Gibbs essay that he wrote way back in 03, and this caused kind of a mini sensation, even though it was just a little three-page article in a theological observer, but boy, it stirred up some real strong responses from people. The five things not to say at funerals. Is everybody going to take a look at this? So what, what was your reaction? I, I agreed with you agreed with everything. That was funny. Okay, Brian, that's, that's good. Good. <laughs> good. I agree with everything, just like the confessions. Just like the confessions. Yeah, well said. All right, good. Yes, Luke. Well, it just, once again, it just highlights the fact that there's so much confusion on what yes. the resurrection is and that we aren't actually Gnostic and that you know, it's kind of the stuff we talked about the last several classes. Correct. It's just ongoing, perpetual right. confusion. Right. Good? Good. What I think is noteworthy here is some of the things you do not say and some of the things you have heard, Right. Some of the things you have said, and now you're repenting of those things, okay, which is good. So his list, let's go through his five real quick. First one you don't say, Bob has received the crown of righteousness, and he has heard the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. And what does Gibbs say? No, he hasn't. <laughs> oh, you're killing me. Where's Bob? As Okamoto likes to say, in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so it was, it was a pastor who's out in West County was telling me this. He said, yeah, I had, had Dr. Okamoto for the very first class he ever taught here. And um, so somebody asked him about, what do you tell, tell people, where's grandma when she dies? In the ground. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dr. Okamoto still working on his sensitivity. He's, gone, he's come a long way. <laughs> he wouldn't mind me saying that. All right. So, but what's, what's, so what, what's wrong with saying he's received his crown, of, his crown of righteousness? Well, he's heard God say, well done, good and faithful servant. What's wrong with that? We uh, get our crown of righteousness at the end time. All right. So at the resurrection in the last days when we get the crown of righteousness, and that's when we get the accolade, well done, good and faithful servant. We're just in the interim state. Now what we get is, ah, you're done working. Come on in and rest for a while. See, we're in the ante room. We're doing the appetizers. It's not the full thing yet. And Gibbs' point here is not to diminish the comfort, but to accentuate the real hope. That's the point. Okay? All right. So second problem. This one's even worse. Margaret has now entered into eternal life. Boy, you hear this one a lot. And so what is Gibbs' response on this? He really hates this one. Why? Max. Yeah, it's not really eternal life, and this is doubly wrong on two ends, right? One is, we, it implies she's already at the full eternal life. Well, no, we're not at the eschaton yet. We're not to the full resurrection. But what's the other problem in the other direction? Yeah, Kyle. She entered eternal life at her baptism. Yes! Her, her eternal life began when she entered Christ's forgiveness. As soon as she was in Christ, she has eternal life. This is John. You have eternal life now. You guys all have it. You don't enter into it when you die. You just go into a new phase of your waiting. That's what's going on there. All right, good? All right, good. Third point, John has gone to his eternal home. Well, not yet. He's waiting for his eternal home. He's, he's, he's twiddling his thumbs, hanging out. We'll get there sometime. All right, good. Fourth point, Julia is with the Lord now forever. Same thing. No, she's in the interim state. That's it. And the fifth one, this is the most notorious of all, perhaps. This is not a funeral. It's Craig's victory celebration. All right, and you guys have already been well educated. What's the problem here? Death is a death is yeah, unit. Yeah, death is not cool. It's not a victory celebration. True, we don't mourn like those who have no hope. But our hope is at the resurrection. And we're not saying, I'm so happy for Craig that he's dead now. It's just dumb to even think about it, saying something like that. Dead's not cool. And so this is the thing we have to remember. Dead isn't cool. And as Gibbs points out, yeah, it's great. He's now out of danger. He, he, he's not going to be harassed by Satan anymore. He can't be tempted. That's great. I'm glad he's out of danger. And I'm glad that he's left this veil of tears. His suffering and his agony is done. And perhaps it was intense at the end. It's a mercy that he doesn't have to suffer. I'm glad for that. But I'm not happy about death. And death is never the goal. Death is never the target. Death is never what I'm hoping for. My hope is the resurrection of the dead. We're going to undo this. And in the meantime, this is a drag. And you guys need to be honest about this with people because when you play games of euphemisms and try to repaint stuff, people think, yeah, but why does this hurt like heck? Someone's lying to me here. So you need to be upfront with people, okay? And while I'm thinking about it, this is also one of the things, don't use euphemisms for death. I hate it. When people talk about, he passed. Passed what? What? He had a good BM this morning. He passed it. What are you talking about? Passed. Come on. Yeah, it's just so, ugh, I hate it. He passed. Or he passed away. What do you mean? No, he died. Say the word died. So when you're announcing a death in the congregation, we were going to pray today for Frank and his, his family because Frank's wife died last night. And we're sad. Say it. Don't say, she died, she passed away last night. Don't say that. You leave that to the funeral directors. That's their, that's their game. They can use all their euphemisms. We say died. Now, you can also say, she has entered the church triumphant. That's true. She is now with Christ, awaiting the resurrection of the dead. Say that. Say, she's now freed from this veil of tears. You can say that. But she died, and that's a bummer. And we're waiting for the resurrection. That's our hope. Let's claim that. Talk that way. Talk that way so people hear it. Don't say passed away. Don't use silly language. All right, good. Anything else on the five things not to say or things you should say? Yes. I guess just a question. I mean, because I, you know, you, I stay away from the word victory so much, but do we, yeah. I mean, is it kind of 
Because I mean, I want to point to the victory of Christ. That sure. Christ did over death. Yes. You know, great, you, where is your sting? That's right. So Christ has conquered. Death has been defeated. And we're waiting for that full resurrection when we all celebrate with Christ completely. Even now, we're anticipating this. We have a certain hope in Christ's promise. He is risen from the dead. We're sure of it. So then you go to the 1 Corinthians 15 stuff. And where will death is your sting? Where will grave is your victory? It's gone. It's right. See, because it doesn't get the last word. The last word is this one. And we're living in anticipation of this, but we're just keeping the focus where it needs to be. And so what you should really have in the experience of the Christian at death is this mixed thing. It's a horror, and yet it's a comfort to know that Christ has conquered. And it's a drag, and there's tears, and it hurts, and yet there's confident hope. And tell your people this. I'm hoping you get this stuff in P classes. But, you know, tell your people when you're helping those who are grieving, there is no set script here. And a lot of them are under a heavy burden to be upbeat. Praise God! He's with Jesus. And they're on the verge of tears. Tell them, go ahead and cry. I'm grieving too. It stinks. He's gone. We'll never see him again. I hate that. Nothing happy about that. But well, I'm a Christian. You're right. So you grieve with real grief. Because this is our reality. But we also grieve with hope. Be upfront with people. Tell them. Give them freedom to grieve. And give them freedom to laugh and have fun. So you're going to have family members who are cutting up in the funeral home and getting a little embarrassed by that. That's okay too. It's okay. You know, I've seen people cracking jokes right in front of the casket. You know, and it's like, oh, it's irreverent. No, it's just fine. This is all okay. It's what we do in the body of Christ because see, we're living in this tension and it's okay. We get it. We get it. And we need to live with that kind of reality. And I'll also encourage you guys to um, cultivate good relationships with your funeral directors. Um, a lot of our habits and practices around funerals are really crazy. I know um, Dr. Holke talks about green funerals or green burials and this kind of stuff. And this is starting to come a little more into vogue, which is good. Because um, people have some crazy ideas about airtight vaults and hermetically sealed caskets and all this kind of stuff. You know, you don't need to preserve the body forever. God is going to resurrect it. We're okay with this. And we don't need to be trying to preserve the body. But at the same time, you treat the body with respect. This is God's creation, which is one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of cremation. Um, cremation, sure, it's not evil. But see, if you have a cremation, what you're lacking is the body then. And how do people have, have their goodbyes? How do they have their chance to be with the person and care for the body and bury it in the right way and respect the body? So you need to have these kinds of things kind of sorted out and think carefully about our right practices. Two questions kind of in this vein. Um, how do you? How would you handle uh, someone that you don't know the status of their? So, in other words, you could ask to do a funeral for somebody who you don't know what's going on. I, I looked at funerals as a chance to share the gospel to the living, and I would do that. So, in other words. My practice was I would do funerals for people, but I didn't do weddings for people. So I don't do weddings for anybody unless they're part of my church. That was my standard. So if, you're gonna, if I'm going to do a wedding, you both have to be Christian members of my congregation, or I won't do it. And that made things easy. For funerals, I would do them. But I would say I will speak what I know about this person, and I will speak the truth. And I would tell family members this and warn them. So I'm not going to preach Uncle Joe into heaven. Um, he was baptized and confirmed, but he hasn't darkened the door of a church in 40 years. So I don't have much confidence. Now, I'm not going to preach them into hell, but don't hear me. I'm not, and I won't even use the um, committal with the, the ashes to ashes. You know, in the certain, certain hope of the resurrection, I won't do that. I will change it and talk about we commit this body to its ground, waiting for the day of resurrection. <laughs> you leave stuff vague. You don't give hope where it's not there. And I, I would do that pretty consistently. More specific example, suicide. Suicides are tough, tough, tough. Um, and you, you need to be honest and just say, and see, I think it cuts, cuts both ways on this. Who in their right mind is going to end their life? So is there insanity going on? Perhaps. And, but, you know, the problem with suicide is this kind of renunciation of I'm going to be my own God. And how do you deal with that? But is there any sin that's unforgivable? No. And so, you know, the idea that oh, I'm going to commit suicide, I'll jump off the building, repent on the way down, and hit the ground there, I'm all good. That's just, no. You, you know, this is not, it's, you're missing the point. Um, but they're hard. The toughest funeral I ever had to do was a guy who had been a member of my church for a long time and committed suicide. Um, and his kids were devastated, and there was just no good reason. And I was, frankly, ticked at him. And when I did his funeral, it came through. And I was just angry. And I used the illustration about, you know, breaking things, and your kids want you to fix them, and some things you can't fix. I can't fix this. No, no one can. And what he did to you kids is just irreprehensible that he did this to you. I was quite angry. It came through. And um, so this is that funeral home. I was doing this. A couple of his sisters were there. And I got done with the funeral. I sat down. And they were livid. And they stood up. I can't believe you're bad-mouthing this good man. And they started doing their own little 
monologue eulogy that I didn't do at the end of the funeral. So it was a little awkward. I also was running a temperature of 103 degrees that day, so it wasn't a fun day. <laughs> but um, <coughs> I still remember that very clearly. <coughs> so they're hard. But you've just got you to speak what you do know. And don't say what you don't. Don't speculate. Don't speculate. Talk about what you know and stick to that. Yeah, and we're short on time, but the cremation thing is becoming so popular. And, you know, I'm not anti-cremation, and I get the cost savings, but do some research. If you're going to actually have a funeral with the body and let the family be able to see the body and, do, and help with the grief, it's not going to be much cheaper to do a cremation. Because by the time you rent a casket and do the things you've got to do, you're not, you're not coming out very far ahead. So do some research into this. And the idea of saving money means you have to do a direct cremation, which means you go from the hospital to the funeral home right to the crema crematory with no waiting. And then the family, all they get is the picture of smiling grandma and an urn. And it doesn't help the grieving process because the whole point is there's dead grandma. She doesn't look right. No, she doesn't. She looks dead. And it's, something's not right. She doesn't look asleep. No, she doesn't look asleep. She looks dead. It's not right. And there's something really important about that in the grieving process. It just is. You know, and you see your dead loved one, yep, they're dead. Now, this is the reality. There's something about that which is kind of important, I think.